Um, so my question is about um, um, like a natural Quran versus, I guess, more something more natural Quran versus the traditional view of the Quran. So a bit specific, but um, for example, if if we take the story of Musa alayhi <clears throat> salam, uh, he went uh, to the sea and he he uh, struck down his staff, and that's of course that's a miracle. Like that's amazing. <laughs> I I cannot get any more uh, coincidental. <laughs> no, that's of course that's a miracle. Um, but if we had a camera back then, or like some other scientific um, uh, stuff, could we um, like explain that and recreate that? And if your answer is yes, because I earlier heard Hamza say um, that um, it might be possible in the future for a person to live 200 years, so getting close to the Nuh uh, so you might agree with that. Um, should we, if something is really going against um, like established science, I don't want to say it like that, but like could we reinterpret a certain stories of the Quran and should we do that to maybe get the absolute answer of the Quran? We don't believe in naturalism. Naturalism is the idea that everything that is, is everything that we can access through the five senses. And if anything above that, anything supernatural. And what are you going to say about the jinn? Like, what are you going to say about the angels? What are you going to say about the, I mean, there's too many things. The point of the matter is, is this is all nat it's called naturalism, you know, or physicalism, you mentioned. Yeah, so. yeah, I, yeah. I mean, what's worse? I mean, think about it conceptually, right? Mm. So as Hijab is saying, naturalism is the view that there's no divine, there is no supernatural, there is no non-physical, and everything can be explained by physical processes. Mm. This is something that Muslims cannot be. Just by virtue of very explicit Quranic statements, right? That there is the unseen. And so on and so forth. As soon as you open the Quran, like, yes. Yeah. So this is very important. Okay. So we can't be philosophical naturalists, which is different from methodological naturalism. So, what, how do you interpret these 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 type of understandings? The thing is, how far are you going to go? Okay. How far are you going to go? And that's something very important to 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 understand here. If you presume that everything has to have a scientific explanation, can everything must be reduced to physical phenomena, then you're going to have a lot of problems with the Quran and the Sunnah. Yes, sure. I would say the better strategy is to be confident in your religion, which I know you are, inshallah, and for you to understand, look, uh, uh, what's the problem with philosophical naturalism? The problem with philosophical naturalism is the minute you find a non-physical thing is the minute the whole of the, the naturalistic project falls. That consciousness. Yeah, that's my point. So philosophical natural basically says all phenomena can be reduced to physical processes. Okay, so all you have to do is find one phenomenon that's not physical. And the easiest way of doing that is basically talking about consciousness, that we have inner subjective conscious experiences. The whole physicalist program, if you like, from a consciousness point of view, is basically saying if you rub a stone hard enough, you're going to have butterflies come out of it, yeah? That's essentially what it's saying. If you and, and 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 obviously we don't have time now to go into the whole kind of understanding of why physicalism doesn't explain inner subjective conscious experiences. In actual fact, we may do that next week, uh, the last live stream before Ramadan, when, and we'll talk about maybe we'll we'll talk about consciousness and other related issues. Mm -hmm. But the point here is there's something even more. The questioner who questions this, mm -hmm. the questioner himself is a sign that physicalism has failed is a greater miracle. Now, with all due respect, uh, having a staff and splitting the sea is, is less of miraculous than the co inner subjective conscious experiences coming from seemingly non-conscious physical processes. Yeah? I have a question as well. Yeah. And that's very important for you to understand, bro, because we forget it. We, really, we externalize these things. But what about you as the questioner? Yeah. yeah. I've got a question uh, to you, actually, on that. You know, yes. You know the... Um, Obviously, support is a sleep number, you know, we would usually ask him on these issues. But you know the, the evolution's paradigm, they say this abiogenesis takes place, yeah? And abiogenesis is, for all intents and purposes, you know, the movement from chemistry to biology, mm -hmm. right, somehow. Now, if, if, we, if we define science as, you know, patterns and regularities of repeating themselves, things that have to be predictable, if we have to have witnessed it in the past, observational, right? When was the last time we saw chemistry change into... Biology, like 
or chemistry becoming biology. If 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 that was something we observed, then surely it wouldn't we wouldn't require all these speculations as to what abiogenesis um, consisted of. Well, the, the, that's an interesting question. But even if we could observe chemistry going to biology, it doesn't in any shape or form uh, well, my, have, have a physicalist understanding. No, my of question is right: consciousness, the idea of um, chemistry going to biology. Could that not be argued in and of itself to be miraculous on the on the current model? Because it's something which the, the five senses and our experience and observations have not. Well, you know, finally you said that. Cause I think yesterday the scientists found uh, they actually had a synthetic cell. They made a synthetic cell. <laughs> That's quite funny. You yeah, say that it was synthetic. yesterday. Yeah. Oh, but synthetic. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I, I didn't read into it. I just yeah. you know when you just see on your timeline yeah. some silly headlines. No, but, that, that, look, but you have to look into what well, that really the, means. The, the greatest, the greatest thing that basically a lot. I see what you're trying to say here. You're trying to say that. Don't we have some assumptions that also presume some kind of miraculous event? Kind yeah. of. What I'm saying is, like, well, the biggest thing that the Quran is the center of the Quranic discourse, really, is the eschatological project, mm. which talks about, like, okay, you know, you're gonna you're gonna die and then you're gonna come back to life. That Allah can bring dead things back to life. You know, He loved about the multi that He brings the, the earth back to life. Mm. All that stuff. So if Allah, and this is the argument that I think Allah is making, right? Is a straightforward observational argument. Allah can bring dead things to life, and you see that, and it's not really explained by a paradigm. Like for the first instance is not explained by a paradigm. It's, we have no, we have not observed. We have ma ashhatum khalq al samawati wal ardu wala khalq al fusihim. We have not let them see or witness yes. the khalq of the heavens or the earth or the khalq of themselves. We have not observed bio, bio, sorry chemistry becoming biology. All we can do is have some kind of what would be termed I, my my view. Is a fictitious or not even fictitious, mythological. Let's you can go further. Religious. Let's go. You have a religious program. It's just you have a religious way of understanding how uh, uh, chemistry became biology, and that is that there was some kind of you know abiogenesis that took place. You try and explain it in physicalist terms, but what you are explaining is something which has not been ever observed. Yes, but they in have to. Sense, they have to miraculous. assume it. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're saying the first living cell, yes. according to the evolutionary paradigm, yes. had to come from basically non -living se seemingly non-living matter. Yeah. yeah, they have to assume that. Yeah, you have to assume that. That's not supported by observation. Yeah, from my so understanding. That's absolutely. Yeah, agreed. So they have to... They have, the, the whole. But, but, the, but what they would say is it's not miraculous in that, from that perspective. They're saying as when our science increases, when we increase our scientific knowledge, we will be able to understand how well, that David Hume's, uh, for example, they go with this usually. David Hume's uh, idea of miracle, right? Which is something which goes against the laws of nature. Or it supersedes trans. Yeah, but whatever. I think David Hume was mistaken on that. Yeah, but if, yeah. if we go with what they believe in, which is that usually, right? If that's the definition of a miracle, this is something which in the laws of nature has no business talking about. Or, or something which is not observed at all. I'm saying that basically the movement from chemistry to biology Biology itself, as a biology itself, as a scientific. Yeah, but in subject. fairness, they, but they would argue Darwinism is not there to explain uh, the origins of the first living cell. Darwinism is there to explain biological change. I, I don't care about Darwinism. I, I just want to talk about the first living cell. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, how, how did that first living cell? Uh, how could non-living matter become living on the paradigm that we have now? How, we have. How comes you're not observing these things? Well, it's even worse, bro. Because even if they could show that a living cell came from non-living matter. What is the living cell according to the paradigm? It's still called processes, meaning yeah. blind and non-conscious. What does blind mean? There is no intentional force behind them, direct them at anywhere. What does non-conscious mean? It means they're not aware of themselves or aware of anything outside of themselves. So even if even they that, said there's a living yeah, matter, yeah. how can consciousness arise from that? <laughs> yeah. It's like me saying, I've got nothing in my pocket, here's 10 pounds. How can I give you 10 pounds if there was nothing in my pocket in the first place? Yeah, yes, yes. There's an Arabic uh, principle, if you like. I don't know if it's a philosophical one. Shit, yeah, but <laughs> you, can't, you can't give <laughs> you what you don't have. have. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sorry, so, yeah. so, you know, uh, you know, if Muhammad Hijab doesn't have wisdom, how can he be talking about wisdom? How can, you, how can, you, how can, how, how can you give life if you're deaf? Exactly. Yeah, that's <laughs> the whole point. So if these things, according to their paradigm, is based on blind, non-conscious physical processes, there's nothing, no intentional force directing them. They're not aware of themselves or anything aware of anything outside of themselves. And how can that give rise to something that has awareness? Yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah, that. Yeah, I, yeah. Now, obviously, there's more to it. Uh, in terms of the philosophy of the mind, you have different conceptions of physicalism, like functionalism, and and so on and so forth.
but this could be addressed maybe another time. But the point I'm trying to say here is there is a greater miracle, bro. The questioner himself, him, the inner being, he has inner subjective conscious experiences. That itself cannot be explained physically. He can't even explain by the neurosciences, by, by neurobiology anyway. Because neurobiology has to assume physicalism as a, as, as, a, as a philosophical assumption to be true in order for it to work in that way. And uh, and there's so much more to talk about this. But the point I'm trying to say is, why? what is the motivation to try and reduce these events uh, to, to a physicalist understanding? Because you've got to be very careful, and I'm giving you some sincere advice here. That could end up just making you just do kufr, uh, leave the, the realm of... Because how far are you going to go? You Angels are physical. Uh, uh, jinn are physical. Yeah, Allah the, is physical. Uh, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> the, how far are you going to go? The next thing. So this is very... Because what you because you need to be very careful with this kind of uh, philosophical naturalism. Um, but maybe we should talk about consciousness uh, in another live stream, inshallah. But hopefully... Has that addressed your question, bro? Yeah, thank you very much, but... Um, I was actually, I know it's a bit late, um, I was actually talking about a traditional view of the Qur'an, of a story in the Qur'an, and I'm not talking about a purely naturalistic uh, view, I'm sorry I'm not that educated in my uh, terms, I'm not English either, but um, I'm talking about a different view from the traditional view that's um, maybe saying like, yeah, let's uh, assume gravity is in play and this goes against gravity. But, but but angels are still, you know, non-physical, etc. But, you know, different from the t traditional view as well. And it's difficult to see. Yeah. Um, if you're saying, can you have a non-traditionalist view of the stories of the Quran? Can you start speculating and saying that maybe the Moses staff has some kind of magnetic, magnetic field in it that would basically separate the seas? I mean, I don't know. I, I leave that to hijab. I just think that's excessive speculation. Yeah, this is what Allah, he, he, you know, he, he, he blamed the سَيَقُولُونَ ثَلَثَةٌ رَبِعُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ you know? Yes, yes, yes. In, in Surah Al-Kahf وَيَقُولُونَ خَمْسَةٌ وَسَادِسُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ رَجَمًا Literally, رَجَمًا بِالْغَيْبِ You know, this such a powerful expression of the Quran. Raj, Rajam is stoning something, right? بِالْغَيْبِ You're throwing stones in the dark. In other words, you're in a dark room. In the unseen, yeah. <laughs> you're in a dark wow. room and you throw stones. You don't even know where you're, you're aiming. Like, you know, imagine playing darts in a, in a, you don't know where the dartboard is and you're in a dark room and you've got a blindfold on as well, you're throwing it. You don't know where you're trying to aim. So, you know, don't fall into that, because obviously the Quran, that's that's the moral of Surah Al Kaf, at least the beginning of it. And that's why it's very important for you to understand what are the main, what's the main purpose of these stories? What are the, what's the main purpose of the stories of, of the NBA? This is very important for you for us to derive. Uh, and sometimes we miss the primary functionality of these stories. And, and it's significant for us to revive that deep Islamic spirituality concerning what the context of these stories are, what they're trying to tell us, and what and what are the main lessons that we're trying to learn. And what's interesting about the story about the dog, you know, was the three persons and the dog, or four and the dog, and so on and so forth. Even Kathir mentions about the dog. Why does Allah mention the dog? And it's very interesting because it has lots of discussion on the dog. And yeah, that. because but the dog is very powerful. Because but it's interesting. Allah mentions the dog because I think there is a tadabbur here yeah. that understanding the kind of spiritual functionality of the dog in the story solves the question. Let me explain. <laughs> Listen to this. You're gonna love this. Yeah, good. The dog is almost <laughs> irrelevant to the story, but the dog happened to be with the people, the pious people, and Allah saved them. And because the dog happened to be with them, Allah saved the dog as well to teach us that if Allah could save a dog. Because it was pious people, <laughs> then Allah will save us if we were pious people. <laughs> and the and the more of the story is the way to remove these shubuhat is to be with pious people. Allah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so there's a lot of power in the stories, but we have to do tadabbur, yaqi. Allah says in the Quran, do they not do the tadabbur of the Quran or the locks on their heart? So you can mirror the meaning. The more more tadabbur you do, the more your heart becomes unlocked to receive His guidance and mercy. But we need to understand there is a difference between tafsir, traditionally, and tadabbur. Although they were used synonymously, but from a technical perspective, tafsir is the meaning. Tadabbur is the kind of reflection over the meaning. We don't have a job with the meaning because we leave that to the mufassirin, we leave that to the scholars. But you should do tadabbur, hmm. to ponder. What, what is Allah saying here? For example, Yaqub alayhi salam telling his sons, go look for 
Yusuf and his Akhi and don't despair of the life giving mercy of Allah. How do you do some tadabbur here? Okay, I feel contextually depressed. My context is making me feel a little bit depressed, not medically depressed, that's a different medical issue, but I feel a bit contextually depressed. Yaqub alayhi salam, just before this verse, he was crying to Allah and he was basically saying that I complained to my about my grief to Allah alone. And then straight away, well, very close, he says to his sons, Do not despair of the life giving mercy of Allah. Where's the connection here? The connection is when you have a context that brings you depression, remind you about the mercy of Allah and Allah will solve your problems for you. And it's so true. A lot of psychologists and counselors, they have issues themselves. And when they remind people about gratitude and about the mercies of Allah, it makes them feel much better. That's a tadabbur, for example. Yeah. Uh, and so engage with the Quran that way and have good people around you, good students of knowledge, good mashayikh to help you and keep you on, you know, orthodoxy, if you like, uh, which is not very narrow, by the way. It's, you know, there's a there's a nice scope. Um, and, you know, if you stay within that, then inshallah, you'll be fine, Akhi. I agree with that. And uh, thank you. Have a nice... Uh... Over and out, Habibi.